Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Optometric Insights Show. Today, we're with uh, Dr. Mick Kling from San Diego. Dr. Kling has uh, an incredible practice. You can check out his website, as well as uh, a consulting company where he talks about profit in our practice and what could be more important than that. Uh, so really, really honored to have him. Make sure to stay tuned to the end and uh, get some great tips on the OI Show. This episode of uh, the OI show, we're here with uh, a good friend of mine, Mick Kling. And Mick is, uh, as I mentioned, a practitioner in San Diego and has got an incredible practice. And Mick has been helping uh, optometrists uh, around the country um, with this elusive concept and uh, enigma called profit in practice. And with our audience being, uh, you know, practitioners that have been in practice for 10 to 15 years or less. You know, this is something that's so critical for us early in our careers to understand a little bit more. But first of all, thank you for joining us for the OI show, my friend. How are you? Absolutely fantastic. What a privilege to be here with you. Looking forward to the conversation. Yeah. So, Mick, you have uh, been in practice for a while. I think uh, I recall you uh, had a had a had a practice. Your first practice back in was it ninety nine is when you kind of started this whole thing and. Um, things have changed over the years. So tell us a little bit about your journey in eye care, getting you to this beautiful practice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Dave, I, um, I graduated in 1993 from SCO, Southern College of Optometry, Memphis. I did a residency uh, in ocular disease immediately following at an Omega Eye Center. And I moved to California right after that. Uh, and I went to work in an ophthalmologist practice here in San Diego, two, two ophthalmologists that had a fairly busy cataract practice. And I became actually really good friends with one of the ophthalmologists who was um, uh, not a whole lot older than me, a little bit closer to my peer. And um, uh, so he and I became good friends. And I remember in the hallway one day he said, Hey, Mick, what are we going to do about this LASIK thing? So you've got to remember, this was like in the early 90s, and, and LASIK was really right. just coming on board. And so we started a right. company, and we, um, I got 20 ODs to invest, and we opened a laser center. He became our LASIK surgeon, and we ultimately sold that business to TLC, which became the TLC La Jolla Center. Uh, which okay. Is the laser center here in La Jolla, in uh, San Diego, and I became the clinical director of that clinic along with uh, Jim Owen, and so right. I spent the early part of my years working in an, in in an ophthalmology practice, but very quickly transitioned into kind of the LASIK world when it was really in its infancy. In two thousand, about maybe early two thousands, I. Uh, decided to go back into private practice and so I bought my first practice and left the laser center and then um, just started buying practices as the years ticked on and we just closed on practice number six two yeah. weeks ago um, my strategy has always been in California up until uh, uh, two years ago you could own as many practices as you want However, you had to spend 50% of your time in each location. Right, right. So you can do the math, and that means you can only have <laughs> locations, right? So, so in order to grow in California, independent practices had to um, acquire and consolidate. And so that's mm -hmm. what I did. I would buy practices that were strategically located around me, roll them into my location, and then we just kept expanding the location. And now right. we have a, a 8,000 square foot building and we've got a busy four doctor practice uh, here in downtown San Diego. Um, so I've always had the goal of always getting back to one location. As I mentioned, we just bought another satellite office two weeks ago up in Del Mar, which is just north of me. Um, and so again, we're growing the empire to some degree and trying to figure out what the best strategy is to, to do that. Um, along that journey, I became friends with a, a couple of guys that were doing some leadership training and consulting, and I got pulled into their world 
um, because I like to talk about money. Right. And so <laughs> it's a good thing. I, it's a good, we need it, right? It's part of running the business. So <laughs> yeah. we, um, I was asked to sort of be the guy on the consulting side to talk about money. And so I started to do a little bit of consulting on the side. I got, I always love spreadsheets way more than being in, in the exam room. Um, I'd rather look at a profit loss statement any day, uh, but uh -huh. I always enjoyed that part of it. So it came very natural to me, even though I don't have like most of us really any formal training uh, when it comes to business finance. Um, and so I just sort of became the guy that would look at practice finances and try to give some advice here and there. Well, that sort of evolved into a job with vision source. So yeah. along this route, we had become a vision source practice and um, the vision source saw what I was doing and asked me to build some educational programs around uh, business finance and business acumen, um, how to run your practices better from a financial standpoint, how to think like a business person. So I started to build uh, some programs for them and then about a year ago, I got asked to come on almost full time as a practice management and transition advisor. Right. And right. So now what I do is I spend 80 percent of my professional time uh, working with our 3200 vision source practices uh, that are transitioning. So we have many members that are selling. We have many members that are acquiring additional locations. We have young ODs that are looking to come into private practice and so we're facilitating uh, that move into independent practice ownership and so my role really is just as an advisor to sort of help that those transitions occur as smoothly as possible mm -hmm. because we as an organization vision source obviously we want to retain our membership and we want to support uh, and perpetuate private practice optometry so yeah. I'm kind of Dave living my dream of very little patient care these days and uh -huh. almost all of my week is spent on the phone with ODs looking at finances helping them understand profitability helping them understand cash flow helping them understand how to sell how to buy um, so it's really been an evolution from a residency in the early 90s yeah very heavily heavily clinically oriented all the way to really just almost all business so, so so Mick, tell tell us you have this interested perspective on profit. So lay out for us what what you see as the traditional kind of perspective on profit, and maybe a new way of thinking about it that could make us better business owners. Yeah. So you know, as I said, most of us have very little, if no, business acumen training. Um, but even if you attended eighth grade economics class, you probably remember learning. Uh, the concept of uh, profit and loss. So money comes into a practice and we spend money to generate the revenue to come into the practice. And then hopefully we don't spend more than what comes in and what's <laughs> left is called profit. That's the, that's the general accounting principle definition. That's the government's formula called gap for profit. Revenue minus expenses equals profit. The problem with that model is that's a very accountant-oriented uh, way to look at the finances of our business because we don't take into consideration the human element and the human behavioral impact of uh, money uh -huh. and the fact that we all have a slightly different money personality and the way we manage money, the way we think about it, the way uh, it plays a role in our lives is different for all of us and so right. those behavioral tendencies often influence how we run a business because we're not dry accountants where our DNA is to be an optometrist and so spreadsheets and budgets and balance sheets don't work for us right what does work for us is the the existing human behavior that we have and so I read a book called profit first and yep um, it's great book. Really great book. It's really kind of taken off in the last couple of years. And that book was sent to me by a CPA who had seen me speak at a Vision Expo event. And he said, I think this book would really resonate with you. And I'll tell you, Dave, I, I read the book and it just I almost fell out of my chair because it it really spoke to a solution 
that I could implement for the practices that I was working with. And so it really changed my mindset about profitability. What profit is, is really a mindset of making a decision that every dollar that we get our hands on in our practices has a purpose and that we have control. We have the ability to decide that profitability is going to be something that occurs. It's not something we hope or pray for at the end of a month or the end of a quarter. Uh, it's something that we plan for and we make it automatic and mechanical so that we don't even think about it anymore. And that's, mm -hmm. the whole, that's what the whole concept of Profit First is based on is structuring your business around that mindset. Yeah. So when you start working with a, a, a practitioner and a doctor, what are some of the biggest obstacles that they encounter in, uh, in revolutionizing their practice to um, actually have money left over or yeah, you know, start, I, to start with? Yeah. When I speak um, on this topic, I have, I, I've, I've done this so many times now with so many different audiences that I can tell you that for 10% of the audience, what, I'm, what I say is not going to resonate at all. It's going to seem too complicated. It doesn't make sense. There's almost a, an emotional turning off of the switch when we get into some of these topics. I think some people are just really intimidated. About 10% will forever be changed. Like their life will never be the same. The way they run their practice will never be the same. And then about 80% will be very intrigued but will not go back and do anything differently. And I think the, the, the difference between the 10% that actually execute and the 80% that don't has to do with how much pain you're in. Mm. In other words, to get a behavioral change to occur, there must be a trigger. And that trigger has to be sufficient enough based on where you feel you are within practice. And so I work with a lot of practices that are in severe cash flow crisis, and they're worried about payroll. They're worried about making their rent payment. They're underpaying themselves. And so those folks are very easy to, to work with. The obstacles that I run into with the other 80 or 90 percent really are the fact that most of us are fairly comfortable. And so we're not in a lot of pain. We want to do a little bit better, but often there isn't a, enough of a trigger to get us to do something differently. Yeah. And so I think it's that it's the same thing that you, you guys teach when you're out doing your thing. Um, we learn a lot when we're out listening to experts, but then how much of it do we go back and actually execute on? And right. that's where it all falls apart. Yeah, yeah. So, Mick, uh, the the concept that I think uh, you know we, we were taught in school, and these, you know, many of us didn't learn a whole lot in optometry school around business. Um, you know, is that there's certain percentages and certain things that we can kind of uh, kind of lay our hat on as far how we're going to successfully run a business, but. What have you kind of learned about uh, about the, the methods or these percentages that could make uh, make some people that are listening today better with their business? You know, what, I spend um, probably half of my week uh, looking at profit and loss statements from optometrists from all over the country, and one of the services that we provide for our Vision Source membership is we will do a cash flow analysis on their practice. In other words, if somebody says, I'm concerned about cash flow or I have questions about it, or where's all the money going, that's the primary reason we get a call. Um, and so we pull the profit and loss statement out and we go through that with a fine tooth comb and we peel out all the expenses. And um, what I've learned is that there are four primary buckets of expenses in an outside okay. practice. Yeah. And the first big bucket is our cost of goods. So that's our right. frames and lenses and contact lenses. That's all the stuff that we buy to resell. And we call that cost of goods. And there's a certain percentage uh, that is typical for the economics of an optometry practice. And I mm -hmm. see on the low end, 25%. On the high end, around 30%. That's pretty common. If you get above 30%, it makes all the other economics not work so well. The second big bucket are people. We have to have human capital, so we have to hire people to come into practice and, and do the work that needs to be done in the business. And human capital costs money. We have to pay payroll. And that metric is uh, varies a lot across the country because the cost of capital, 
human capital is different in Iowa than it is in Southern California or Northern California. So um, that can range anywhere on the low end around 20% to some cases up to 30%. Mm -hmm. the, set, the third big bucket is what I call place or occupancy. So that's the facility that we have to operate in. We have to have a building and we have to pay electricity bills and we have to pay maintenance and if we have somebody clean the building. And so our occupancy is a, another big expense for a lot of us. Yeah. And um, that typically runs 8 to 10% nationwide. And okay. then I, just for simplicity, I encapsulate everything else into a things bucket. Right. And that's all the other things that, that are needed to run the practice. Paper clips and staplers and paper and insurances and mm -hmm. coffee for the coffee maker. And that runs anywhere from about 10 to 15%. Okay. So if you if you think about a practice in those a real simple structure of those four basic buckets of expenses, yeah, and and manage your practice looking at those four metrics, it will really you don't you almost don't have to get much great more granular than that to really understand where the money's going. Yeah. And so those are the that's an example of some of the kinds of things that, that we teach in our business acumen courses, which is mm -hmm. We don't want to be we don't want to be CPAs or finance experts. We just want to have some basic business acumen and understand what some of those numbers uh, need to be within the practice. So, right. long answer to basically say, um, after looking at hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of practices around the country, we see these ranges that are acceptable. When somebody slips out of range we start to have a conversation about how to, how to make a course correction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you. That's, uh, that's really helpful. And I think that uh, some of those metrics you can be looking at and, you know, in, in Seattle and Southern California, our rent is higher and our, you know, capital may be a little bit higher and we have to manage our cost of goods maybe a little bit more if we're wanting to have a little bit left over. If you're elsewhere in the country, you know, you you uh, may have different, you know, as in Iowa, as you mentioned, or in South Dakota, where I'm from, it's uh, maybe a little bit easier on uh, rent or on uh, on, on the uh, 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 you paying your individuals and the people that work with you. So I appreciate you bringing this perspective. Now, Mick, you, you have a, a service that you provide to people if they're uh, wanting to learn more about profit and um, share with us where we can learn more about this sort of uh, information that you're dealing with here. So probably the best way to go to learn more is go to impactod.com. So I-M-P-A-C-T-O-D.com. And I have a website that just gives an overview of some of the services that I offer and um, some of the consulting that I do. Prior to COVID, I had an absolute blast inviting doctors to my office. I have a conference room here in the office, and um, we were holding quarterly workshops where we would invite doctors into the practice. Yeah. And that really, I think, was some, one of the most rewarding experiences, not only for me, but the attendees, because it really allowed us to get deep. And so you'll find some information on the website about workshops, and we've been trying to do some of them virtually. Uh, but really excited and hopeful that maybe we can get these ramped right. up after COVID settles down. But go to impactod.com. You know, all my contact information is there. Cool. What we do from a consulting and a workshop standpoint is all there. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you, Mick. I sure appreciate you joining us for this episode of the OI Show. We, we're really, really uh, honored that you uh, could join us. You've been a, a great friend and you know really impactful for a lot of my colleagues in the Vision Source community. and. Uh, you're a stud, man. I miss seeing you. Hopefully, we'll see you again soon. You too, Dave. I so appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. All right. And thank you for joining us for this episode of the Optometric Insight Show. Make sure to like and subscribe. And uh, if you could leave us a five-star review, we would be most grateful. And please stay tuned for the next episode of the Optometric Insight Show.